Sadness is being compounded by anger in the wake of the Orlando massacre. So many of us wondering, how could something like this happen again? New revelations about the gunman, Omar Mateen, have people scratching their heads. There are reports that he visited Pulse, a gay nightclub, multiple times before he opened fire early Sunday morning. He apparently also cased Disney World as a possible venue for his mayhem. While the investigation continues into his motives, survivors of the attack are, for the first time, sharing their stories of chaos and sadness alongside the doctors who helped save their lives. One of the lucky ones is Angel Colon, who is originally from Framingham. I was able to peek over and I can just see him shooting at everyone. And I can hear the, sh uh, the shotguns closer and I look over and he shoots the girl next to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just there laying down, I'm thinking, I'm next, I'm dead. Part of the huge pressure this tragedy put on the healthcare system was the demand for blood. This is what ensued. Thousands of people lined up and waited hours to donate blood, something concrete they felt they could do to help. But this outpouring of support put a spotlight on a new donation policy, one that turned away many would-be donors who happened to be gay. In May, the FDA released new recommendations that would allow gay men to donate blood, something they haven't been able to do since the AIDS crisis back in the 80s. But they could only donate if they'd been celibate for a year. Critics charge these restrictions have no scientific bearing and are discriminatory. Joining me now to discuss this new policy is Glenn Cohen, director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. Glenn, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So give me a quick recap of the history of the restrictions on gay men donating blood, because as we mentioned a moment ago, the policy was just liberalized. How has it evolved over the years? Absolutely. So starting in the early 1980s, in the wake of the HIV crisis, essentially the policy was a lifetime ban or deferral, to use a technical term, for any man who had ever had sex with another man, even once since the 70s. Before that, was there also a ban that involved a, a high number of partners, or am I wrong about that? So in terms of the bans, there's a series of different bans. There's one regarding MSM. There's always been one for people who've had sex with uh, prostitutes and people who've engaged in prostitution. MSM is men who have sex with That's them. right, and that's an important distinction in that although the ban is often described as a gay blood ban, in fact, it affects everybody who's ever had sex even once under the old policy. Noted. And that policy persisted till uh, mid-May of last year, where FDA liberalized it a little bit to make it one year of celibacy. If you've had sex with a man in the last calendar year, you cannot donate blood. What is the stated rationale for the current policy? Stated rationale for the current policy, as it was for the older policy, was to protect the quality of blood in the blood supply, the safety of blood in the blood supply, and the public's trust. What about why a year is the necessary window of time? How do, they, how do proponents make that case? Yeah, so proponents, uh, the FDA and its guidance pointed from data from Australia that had moved uh, several years ago to a one-year ban and had collected data and suggested that the one-year ban did not compromise the safety of the blood supply. Although many people, including me, think one year is still far too conservative. And indeed, countries like South Africa have a much smaller mm. ban of six months. All right, so why is one year too conservative? For a number of reasons. The first reason is the risks we're talking about are extremely low. And the reason is every single pint of blood donated in America is repeatedly tested and quarantined for a period of time. You say repeatedly, there are multiple tests. There are multiple donation. tests that are, go that are going on, not only for HIV, but for hepatitis, among other things. And essentially, the estimated risk by the FDA of something slipping through, and this is whether it's from straight people or gay people, is about one in two million. Hmm. And indeed, the existing nucleic acid test that we have now can detect in a very short period, seven to day, 10 days after infection, and blood is routinely held for a period of time to make sure to do that test. I want to make sure that I get this, this detail right here, because this is something I was wondering about. Uh, if there weren't a one-year ban, I had wondered if it was possible that you'd have, hypothetically, a gay man donating so soon after he potentially had contracted HIV that the tests afterward would not be able to pick that up. Is that a concern? So this is why all the tests are delayed and the kind of tests that we do now in the blood is held for a period of time in order to detect this. And indeed, in countries like Italy in particular, they have gotten rid of any period of deferral. They've moved to what's called test and assess. So they test the blood, they have a behavioral questionnaire, they group you into a risk group, and then they decide what to do on an individual basis. Instead of relying on a stereotype mm -hmm. and saying all gay men are the same and we have to worry about their blood, they do individualized assessments. So how, what would your ideal 
test policy, or uh, pardon me, donation policy look like? My ideal policy would look quite a lot like Italy's, mm -hmm. which is again to have individualized assessment. And the way I describe it is, if you look just statistically at the map of the United States, there are areas that have extremely high concentrations of HIV infection. We went zip code by zip code and said, by virtue of living in this zip code, you, whether you're straight or gay, have to be celibate for an entire year. You would look at me like I was crazy. You would say, that's a terrible policy. Why don't you make it more individualized? And that's what we've been urging in the Journal of American Medical Association, among other places, urging the FDA to do. And indeed, 80 Congress people, including Senator Warren and Senator Bernie Sanders, signed on to a letter urging HHS to change the policy. It seems like both this 12-month policy that's in place right now and the more liberalized policy that you're talking about they both rely on people honestly reporting their sexual history. Is that something that anyone, whether they're gay or straight, young or old, really can be counted on to do? Well, they rely on people uh, reporting their sexual history, and indeed much of the studies suggest that people do, by and large, report on their sexual history accurately. Hmm. But the important thing is that we don't just rely on that. As I said, every Point pint taken. of blood is assessed and repeatedly tested to make sure it's safe to enter the blood supply. What do you think the odds are that we see another significant liberalization in the next year or so? You know, I'm hopeful. It may depend a little bit on who takes the White House. Bernie Sanders did sign the letter I talked about. Right. Uh, Senator Clinton did not. And oh, it'll be interesting. interesting to see if she's asked on the stump and Donald Trump as well, whether they would change the policy. Right. We have a new FDA commissioner, so there's some hope. Glenn Cohen, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.